Dealing with Temptation is the title of my message today. Uh, anyone challenged with temptation? <laughs> Comes in all shapes and forms. Uh, every moment of every day, temptation raises its ugly head, I'm quite sure, if your experience is like mine. But today we have some great wisdom from our Lord's half-brother James in his little letter titled James towards the back of your New Testaments. Hope you'll turn there in your Bibles. If you need a Bible, there should be a black-covered book in one of the chairs somewhere in front of you there. We're going to be in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Dealing with temptation. We need to be very aware as Christians what's involved in dealing with the temptations that arise in our day-to-day -day living. Anybody know what this creature is? That is an anaconda. That is not something you want to spend a lot of time petting or anything. And you notice that it's eating a crocodile. Uh, they have an amazing ability to eat large animals. So I'd like to introduce dealing with temptation with this illustration of the anaconda. Pastor John Ortberg uh, came up with this fictitious manual for Peace Corps volunteers in South America. Uh, something humorous that would remind them of the dangers of where they were heading into the jungles of South America and how to, what to do if they came across one of these large boa constrictors, these anacondas. So he comes up with 10 things to be careful to do if you ever run across an anaconda. So please note these things in case it happens to you. What to do if you're attacked by an anaconda. Are you listening carefully? Get your pens ready. Number one, if you're attacked by an anaconda, do not run. The snake is faster than you are. Number two, lie flat on the ground. Are you with me? <laughs> Number three, keep watching. Put your arms tight at your sides and your legs tight against one another. Hopefully you're not bow-legged. <laughs> Number four, the snake will begin to climb over your body. Number five, do not panic. Number six, the snake will begin to swallow you from the feet end. You've got some time here. Number seven, step six will take a long time. It's not going to happen just immediately that you're swallowed. Number eight, after a while, slowly and with as little movement as possible, reach down, take your knife, and very gently slide it into the snake's mouth. Then suddenly sever the snake's head. Number nine, be sure that your knife is sharp. <laughs> and num number 10, the last rule here is be sure you have your knife. <laughs> be sure you have your knife. You know, far more dangerous, really, than being attacked by an anaconda 
And hopefully the steps wouldn't follow this course that, that I just read. But far more dangerous than being attacked by an anaconda are the temptations that daily come into our lives to trip us up and which, if they are left unchecked, lead to spiritual death. So I hope we can sense the seriousness of this topic today. Will you turn with me then to James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. James says in these verses, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Number 14, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust or strong desires. Verse 15, then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Our fleshly desires can lead us to sin and spiritual death. Please note, first of all, that God never tempts anyone to sin. That is so clear in verse 13, where James says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. We cannot blame God for the temptation that comes into our lives. We cannot say, God made me this way, and it's really his problem that I give in to temptation. He's given me these desires. It's really him that is ultimately uh, at fault for my giving in to temptation. We do know that the Lord allows testing in our lives, and that's been clearly taught by James earlier in chapter 1. There are outward testings that come to bring maturity and perseverance uh, in our lives. They are good things that God wants to bring through the outward testings that come into my life. Trials produce good things. James says in James chapter 1 that trials or outward testings produce endurance. They produce maturity spiritually in Christ. They bring completeness as a Christian. Uh, Trials, the outward trials that come, help us to be people who are not lacking in anything, James says, as far as our spiritual needs are concerned. Trials remind us, remind the brother who has humble circumstances, who's poor in this world, that there's something better that's going to happen one day for that believer uh, in the Lord's presence. Trials also remind the rich person, the one who has great means, that this life is not all there is uh, and that the rich man is to glory or to boast in his humiliation. Trials also are good because they remind us that life is short here in this world. We're not going to be on planet Earth forever living in these bodies. And the trials remind us then that eternal life ultimately awaits those who know Jesus as their personal Savior. The Lord does allow testing because testing brings good things into our lives as Christians. But the Lord does not tempt anyone to sin. He does not tempt us to fall into sin, which would drag us down spiritually and ultimately lead to death. Temptation from, to sin comes from within and not from our holy God who's completely separate from sin. James says, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. 
That's not a good excuse. It's our human nature to want to blame someone else for our failings. Did you realize that? It's really somebody else's fault that I live this way, that I'm doing these things. They're really to blame. That goes all the way back to the beginning, doesn't it? Do you remember Adam and Eve? Turn with me in your Bibles to the Old Testament, the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. And we have a clear picture of what human nature is like. Genesis 3, verses 12 and 13. Adam, it says, the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. And then verse 13, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. That is our human nature to point a finger of blame at someone else for our giving in to temptation and entering into sin. God is not the source of temptation to sin. Our holy God, completely separate from sin, cannot be tempted himself. God is completely holy. Do you remember Peter the Apostle in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16? You might want to jot down this reference. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, Peter says, But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Verse 16, Because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. There's nothing in God to which evil can make an appeal. God is literally untemptable, James says. Satan tried to bring temptation to Jesus, remember, on the Mount of Temptation. Matthew chapter 4 records that. Tried to tempt Jesus, but ultimately God is untemptable. Do you remember Hebrews 4.15, where the writer of Hebrews says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. He cannot be tempted to sin. He is untemptable. And our holy God does not tempt anyone uh, as well. God does not bring any experience into our lives in order to drag us down. God wants to build us up. He wants to strengthen us. So testing, outward testing comes to strengthen us, to bring us on toward maturity, but he will never tempt us in a way that would drag us down spiritually. Remember that God's gifts are always good. And on the other hand, Satan is the one who tempts. Let's look at that passage in Matthew chapter 4 where Jesus is being tempted. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, we'll read. Matthew 4, 1 to 3, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But you know how Jesus answered with each, with each of the temptations that came to Jesus. Verse 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word uh, that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus always responded to temptation with Scripture. That's so vital for you and me to remember. We need to be acquainted with God's Word and be ready when tempted to say, no, I, I'm not going to give in to that temptation because I know that God's Word says this. And if we know it well, we can 
and respond with the actual scripture in uh, saying no to temptation. James makes it very clear in verse 13 that temptation to sin does not come from God. He created us, remember, as very good. Genesis chapters 1 and 2. All of his creation was very good. But he gave us the, the will to say yes or no to his good plan. And we know that Adam and Eve chose to rebel against that one rule that God had given them not to partake of the fruit of this tree of knowledge. And they rebelled against that one command. The Lord seeks to do a good work in us until the day of Jesus Christ. Remember Paul saying that in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He has a wonderful plan for our lives in Christ. So rather than blaming our Creator for our sin problem, or even saying, you know, the devil made me do it, that's not a good excuse either. Let's consider the real source of temptation as James reveals it here in verses 14 and 15. Remembering that our fleshly desires can lead to sin and ultimately to spiritual death. We're tempted to sin by our own desires. Verse 14 is clear. Are you there? Back in James 1, verse 14, James says, But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Just as this, what is that thing, a perch? I don't know what it is. It looks like a perch, maybe. Uh, tempted with the bait, temptation can draw us away from our place of safety. James says, but each one is tempted when he is carried away. And James is using the imagery that you see on the screen, really, as he brings this truth uh, to his readers. They can be carried away. They can literally be lured away, dragged away, drawn away from safety, attracted by bait, as we see the fish attracted to the bait this imagery that James is using is uh, from the images of hunting and fishing. Game are lured sometimes to a trap or to a snare because there's bait to be had. Fish are lured away from their safe hiding place by the bait that covers the hook. We are lured from our place of safety, uh, that place of Restraint from sin. James is picturing this fish swimming happily along in a straight line, but then someone throws some bait out and the fish is carried away, drawn away from the place of safety to the bait, little knowing that the bait is going to lead to death. I'd like to share some things that hopefully will be helpful to us as Christians. Uh, even as the fish or the, the deer, the elk, whatever it might be, has a safe place, where is that safe place for you and for me as Christians? Notice these places of safety for us. I believe Paul in Romans 12, 1 and 2 uh, gives us a safe place when he says that we need to present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice to God. In other words, Lord, here I am. I want to love you. I want to live for you. I want to serve you throughout the days of my life. You're presenting yourself to him. And then Paul continues in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to this world system that leaves God out but be transformed by the renewing, continually being renewed in your mind as you reflect on Scripture, uh, reflect on the goodness of God. This is a place of safety, dear friends. Present yourself to Him. 
be in the process of transformation as you renew your mind on Scripture. And then another place of safety is to be diligent to be an approved workman. Do you remember 2 Timothy 2.15? Uh, an approved workman is someone who's able to handle accurately, Paul says, the word of truth. We need to be students of God's word ourselves, growing in our understanding of God's revealed will in scripture. Uh, and it is a place of safety if we're daily, regularly making God's word a part of the fabric of my life. Another important place of safety is meditating on the Word of God. Do you remember Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, uh, where the psalmist says that we are to meditate on the Word of God day and night. Meditate, think about, chew on the things that you're reading in Scripture. Spend time with God's Word. And then James, later in chapter 1, says that we need to be doers of God's word and not just hearers who deceive themselves. We need to take that step of being a doer rather than just a hearer. That will be a safe place for us. And then he says to put on the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Remember how that passage begins, verse 10 of chapter 6, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand firm against the wiles, against the schemes of our adversary. We, we must have the helmet of salvation, uh, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, uh, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, uh, we need the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, ready at all times. Uh, that knife has to be ready if the anaconda starts swallowing you. Uh, and in the spiritual realm, we must have the sword of the Spirit. We must have all of the armor in place. And then to allow the Holy Spirit to control your life, Ephesians 5, 15 and following. Remember Paul's challenge there. He says, don't... Uh, be drunk with wine, for that's a waste of your time. Uh, or you could put other things in the equation. Don't be enamored with pleasure. Don't be thinking that your possessions are going to bail you out ultimately. Uh, don't allow anything to control you other than God himself, his spirit. Let him control you. Uh, that's a place of safety, dear friends. And then I believe being committed to the Great Commission. Do you remember the Great Commission? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, teaching them all that I've commanded you. Uh, the Lord's promised them to be with you till the end of the age. Uh, if we're really part of carrying out the Great Commission, it's going to do wonders as far as keeping me from temptation uh, to sin. If I'm busy with the Lord's work, uh, seeking to honor him, to further his kingdom, that's a place of safety. And then being accountable to the body of Christ. Regular fellowship with God's people in Bible study, life groups, worship services, one-on-one uh, -on -one discipling, uh, small groups together studying God's word. Uh, these are places of safety. We can't just chuck them out uh, and be careless about taking these steps if we're going to be victorious over temptation and sin. Remember the hook, dear friends. Remember the hook. The bait looks pleasant. What is a sin that, you, don't tell me, but think about it. A sin that tempts you, a, a temptation that comes regularly into your life. It's attractive. Or you wouldn't be tempted to, to do what that temptation is calling you to do. The bait is attractive. But always there's a hook, dear friends. 
Uh, the fish doesn't see the hook, grabs the bait, and, and that hook leads it to death. Temptation attracts our fleshly desires. James says, and you are enticed by your own lust. Enticed is a word that means to catch by bait. Lust is a word that means desire, strong desire. God has given us normal desires in life. These are God-given desires. They are not sinful in themselves. These normal desires entice us when we want to satisfy them in, in ways that are outside of God's revealed will. For instance, eating is a normal <laughs> desire. I have that desire at least three times a day. And you know, after dinner hour, it's constant, you know, until I go to bed. So I really have to go to bed early or I might have a problem. Eating is normal, gluttony is sin. Sleep is normal. Laziness is sin. The sexual relationship is a God-given, wonderful gift in the right context. Hebrews 13.4 says that marriage is honorable and the marriage bed is undefiled. But then it continues, fornicators and adulterers God will judge. So you see the normal God-given desire is good, created by God, something that we are to enjoy in the context that God has created it to be that, that, that good thing. It becomes sin when we pursue the desire in the wrong setting. Temptation always carries with it some bait that appeals to our natural desires. A fish does not bite a bare hook, typically, unless they're just so thick that you can't avoid the bare hook. The bait attracts the fish, but the hook is hidden that eventually brings the fish to death and to someone's dinner plate. The bait is the exciting thing. Remember King David's sad story? Should have been uh, at war, but he was instead on his rooftop and happened to see Bathsheba bathing on another rooftop. He saw the bait and was attracted to it, but he didn't see the consequences of his decision. He didn't see the hook in the bait. What were some of the consequences of that sin in David's life? What happened as a result of his sin with Bathsheba? His child died of that union. What other consequences, what, what, other, what other hooks did he run into? David plotted to kill and did carry it through, killed Uriah the Hittite, which was one of his mighty men, an honorable man, a soldier dedicated, devoted to his nation. He murdered a brave soldier, Uriah the Hittite. Do you remember any other consequences of his sin with Bathsheba? The visit from Nathan, who God had told. The prophet Nathan came to him and set him straight. Uh, Psalm 51 is a record of David's repentance and confession of that sin, probably a year after it happened. So all of that time uh, between the sin and the confession, not a happy time for David. But consequences yet to come for him. What about the violation of his daughter Tamar by her half-brother Amnon? What about Absalom, his son, his beloved son Absalom's rebellion to him? 
All of these consequences came as a result of what David thought was a wonderful thing as he saw this attractive woman bathing. There's bait there, but he didn't see the bare hook that would cause all of these difficult things to happen. The bait keeps us from seeing the consequences of sin. My brother Rick, diagnosed with stage three lung cancer, thought it was an adult thing to do to start smoking as a teenager. You know, it made him look cool or whatever. I don't know what it made him do. But now he's suffering the consequences. The bait looked attractive in, the, in that day, but now he's dealing with a life-threatening disease. Dear friends, please look for the hook before you say yes to the bait. Instead of blaming God for our giving in to temptation, we need to understand our role in this process. There is a safe place as we walk closely with the Lord, but there's great danger and even spiritual death awaiting the one who's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Our fleshly desires can lead to sin and ultimately to spiritual death. Notice finally that spiritual death is the end result of unconfessed sin. Spiritual death is the end result. That's the goal. That's where you're going to finish if your sin is not dealt with by faith in Christ. James changes the imagery in verse 15. He's changing now from fishing and hunting and luring fish or game. Uh, he changes the image to conception and birth. You ladies can be with me here on verse 15. Uh, you've experienced this, many of you have experienced this. James says in verse 15, then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. When there's a conception, eventually there's a birth. And when sin is accomplished, when sin has run its course, it brings forth death. When we move beyond desire for the bait, when we move beyond the deception of the bait and willingly take it, a conception takes place. You've conceived a child. You've given in to sinful desires and you're going to give birth to sin. What is sin? The word that James uses for sin in the Greek New Testament means to miss the mark. It literally means to miss the mark as if you were shooting an arrow at a target uh, instead of hitting the target, you've, you've missed. The target is God's standard for how we need to live our lives, how he's designed us to have happiness. When we give in to temptation, we give birth to sin. We're missing the mark of what God's desire for us is. And sin leads ultimately to spiritual death, when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Again, it's so important to look at the end result of giving in to temptation. The temptation's attractive. The bait looks good. I'm hungry for the bait. But remember the end result. It ultimately leads to death. What is death? What, what does death refer to? Death, I think James is saying, includes all of the miseries that arise out of sin. He's not just talking about physical death one day. We know that that is the consequence of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden. Physical death came to them as it comes to all of their descendants, you and me included. But beyond physical death, 
the concept of death includes all of the miseries arising from sin. A couple of my brothers used to think I was a, a spiritual fanatic, a religious fanatic, when I first came to the Lord as an 18-year-old uh, and thought that I was giving up on so much that so much pleasure that I could enjoy if I wasn't this straight-laced religious person now. But isn't that the lie of the adversary, dear friends? Uh, living and for the world, for the world system, pursuing a course of sinfulness, really is an enslaving lifestyle. Look at the person who pursues drugs, alcohol, uh, illicit sexual relationships. Those are enslaving lifestyles, dear friends. And even though my brothers thought I was enslaved, I would take my enslavement to Christ uh, any day over what the world has to offer me. You see, we're either slaves of sin and the world or slaves of <laughs> our eternal God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's a happy ending for those who are enslaved to Him. Death and its miseries include broken fellowship with God. Sin breaks my fellowship with God. I've rebelled against His standard. I've not lived up to what He has designed me to enjoy uh, from His hand. It includes physical death. There are sins that can lead to physical death as well. And perhaps you've known people that have had their lives cut short uh, because of pursuing a course of sinfulness that ultimately led to their, their death. I just had a, a wonderful meeting with a childhood friend uh, who was the son of missionaries. And it just so happened that the missionary's parents lived down the road from our farm in Yakima, the Aronson family. Uh, the, the old man and woman, forgive my calling them old because I'm in their category now. Uh, they had a son, they had two sons. Uh, Ed Jr. became a missionary and served with Africa Inland Mission uh, in East Africa for decades and saw the Lord work through his life in many wonderful ways. But Ed Sr. had another son who chose a different path, who chose the world, who chose addiction to alcohol, and basically was out on the street uh, in Yakima uh, having pursued that course. He also, Howard, died as a young man uh, because of his alcoholism. Uh, but thankfully, <laughs> Cameron, the friend that I met with, said that Howard, Uncle Howard, had come to the Lord uh, really on his deathbed. So praise the Lord for that. Death, physical death, can be brought into our lives because of sin. Uh, and then ultimately separation from God forever. Separation from God. Death means separation. The second death is separation from God for eternity and whatever that involves. Not pleasant. So dear friends, my heart for myself and for you is to look beyond the bait and understand that hidden in the bait is the hook or the trap we need to carefully consider the end result of acting on temptation that comes, and it will come daily. Consider the end result of acting on that temptation, the physical and spiritual death. Please remember this, our fleshly desires, if used wrongly, can lead to sin and spiritual death. I'd like to apply this in a couple of ways. A couple of verses that are really important in this whole discussion is 2 Timothy chapter 2, 22. 
I would encourage you to look at both of these verses, uh, to think about them, perhaps even to memorize them, and, and also have a conversation with your kids or grandkids about these verses. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Now flee, run away from youthful lusts, or the desires of life, and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. On the one hand, we're to run away from temptation. On the other hand, we're to run toward righteousness and peace uh, with God's people. These couple of verses are important. And then 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I think you're familiar with it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. That is a powerful verse, dear friends. When you are tempted with whatever it is that tends to tempt you into sin, remember that God has provided a way of escape. He's faithful and then another thing would be to reflect on any area of weakness in your life related to temptation. Uh, we all have differing kinds of temptations. Uh, things that tempt me might not be any temptation to you at all. Things that tempt you might not be a temptation for me. But think about what is it that trips you up? Is it, is it anger? Uh, is it jealousy? Is it, is it words that are not uplifting to those around you? Is it lust, sexual lust? What is it that trips you up? God's word addresses all of these things. It'd be a great practice to find a particular verse that speaks to that particular area that you're tempted to fall into. To memorize it, to have it ready, uh, as Jesus did when he replied to Satan's temptations, it is written, it is written, it is written. We need to know and apply God's word as temptation comes. I've shared this picture and, and this illustration before, but we have a couple ladies from Central America who might appreciate this picture. This is in Guatemala City. This is a sinkhole uh, that happened in 2010. That's an impressive sinkhole. I wouldn't have wanted to been, been there when that sunk. How about you? In late May of 2010, when the tropical storm Agatha had finally finished its course, a 330 foot deep sinkhole opened in downtown Guatemala City. Like all sinkholes, this one caused the ground to collapse suddenly. But in this case, it also sucked land, electric poles, a three-story factory building, and even a security guard into its deadly pit. The government was also working with 300 neighbors of the sinkhole whose lives and homes were still endangered. According to a report in the Christian Science Monitor, sinkholes in the United States are most common in these states. Florida, just giving this information free of charge so that you don't move there, Florida, Texas, Alabama, Missouri. Sorry, George. <laughs> Kentucky, Tennessee. The Floreses should have been here today yeah. from Tennessee. And Pennsylvania. 
The ground beneath these states is rich in easily dissolved rock types. When enough water seeps into these formations, they collapse, creating the large crater known as a sinkhole. Land that looks stable and strong on the surface suddenly collapses, often producing havoc for anyone who lives near the sinkhole. Unfortunately, our interior lives can resemble the danger zone of a sinkhole. When we're too busy to spend time with God, or when we refuse to deal with past hurts, habitual sin, secret addictions, character flaws, we're setting ourselves up for a collapse. The sinkhole could happen in your spiritual life. The surface of our life may look stable and secure on the outside, but underneath the exterior, we're actually sitting on a fragile base. The storms of life, or even just the normal process of living, can suddenly expose our hidden vulnerabilities, causing spiritual and relational sinkhole to open up. So, dear friends, we need to be prepared to do spiritual battle every day of our lives. There's no days off. Our spiritual knives need to be sharp. We need to make sure that our lives are on the solid ground of a relationship with Christ and that we're living each day according to God's revealed will in His Word. Our fleshly desires can lead to sin and spiritual death. 